This area, the capital interest theory in general, is extremely difficult. All right. So if you're if you're trying to read this and you're like, wow, this I just don't get it. I must be dumb. Not necessarily. You, you might be, but it could just be because the material is really difficult. All right. It's uh, literally been called the, the black hole of economics, and not just in terms of the Austrian school, but just in general, capital and interest theory is extremely difficult. The the controversies that raged throughout the 20th century on that. Most economists just run from it. They say, "No, I, I don't want to get sucked into that. It's, it's just too difficult." So, um, but but it's important. So, I'm not saying you need to be an expert in this, but it really, if you understand what's going on in this chapter, you really are in a much better position to understand the real world. I mean, this I don't want to say it's the essence of Austrian economics, but it's extremely important to understand what's going on in this chapter. And this really is one of the things, like I said in my first talk, that. Distinguishes Austrian economics. That when somebody asks me, a mainstream person, when I was at NYU, you know, why do you go to this Austrian colloquium every week? What's the difference? I didn't say, oh, because we really take, you know, subjective utility seriously. No, I would say because their capital theory is just so much better than what we're learning down down the hall. So, again, that's it. Really pays off, and in terms of you thinking that you're a good economist, and that you can actually explain to a layperson what's going on in the world, an understanding of what's going on in this chapter is really crucial. Another、uh, benefit from from learning this material and really understanding it is you'll have a much better appreciation for Bombavrik and Hayek. That if all you knew of Hayek was the road to serfdom, you could kind of think, yeah, he's kind of overrated. But the stuff that Hayek does in capital theory is really impressive. In his book Pure Theory of Capital, in particular, is、um, just an incredible、uh, illustration of just the guy's mental powers. All right, so I'm not saying he every, everything he does in there is, is correct or that I agree with it, but As I'm saying, if you think Hayek's really overrated, it might be because you haven't read his Capital Theory. Now, having said that, it's very difficult material, and really, you, you appreciate how clear Reuter Rothbard is because in this chapter, it's just moderately difficult. You're kind of like,、eh. whereas if you're reading Hayek, it's like passing a stone. That you're just like, oh, well, this is so. <laughs> All right, and really, it is it is tough material. I mean. If Hayek sent you a birthday card, it would be you know terse and very difficult. And so, can you imagine him talking about capital theory? So, Rothbard is, is very clear. But again, if you go and look at some of the stuff you get from Hayek, it's、um, Rothbard has limited amount of space to, to work with it. So, there's things that you can get from Hayek and Bombavrik that have not, in my opinion, survived. So, this is sort of like the the、um, you know the, the against the Whig theory that I think there are things. In Bombavrik, that Mises didn't、um, didn't carry through, and so that you, you you do benefit by going back and reading Bombavrik and then and even Hayek. So, okay, that is all the、uh, the pre- well, one last sort of prefatory comment.、Um, in case I forget to mention it, in terms of advances in the future, what can you know? If I'm a young Austrian, what can I do with my career? I, I'm not sure, but I think it's possible that somebody who was familiar with quantitative finance that understood. The you know put call parity and all the things and you know the Black Scholes formula that sort of approach mean variance modeling of、um, w- Wall Street activities who understood that material and then also read this chapter from Rothbard and and could somehow come up with something maybe in between the two I think there's there's scope for something along those lines because Rothbard alludes to it you know he mentions risks and uncertainty and he says how you know actually in the real world there's not just An interest rate, and then、um, entrepreneurial profit or loss. There's also this thing about different levels of riskiness. And so, anyway, the quantitative finance people, yeah, they, I think they take it too far, and they assume specific functional d- distributions and things like that. But they're they're thinking a lot more.、Um, they're taking it a lot further when they say, what if we really want to deal with the fact that. There are different levels of risk in different enterprises, or if you want to call it uncertainty. You know, I don't want to talk about that issue right now. But the point is, Rothbard leaves open huge avenues of potential research, and I think、um, current Austrians who are just trying to pick research agendas, they might be able to benefit. And then it would also be marketable that you could apply this this financial stuff to、um, to Austrian theory or capital theory. Okay.、Um, One of the so I'm, what I'm going to do with, with the time I have here, I'm going to go through and I'm going to mostly focus on when I get to that point, the those diagrams showing what happens with the original structure of production, how it gets to the to the one after net savings and investment. But let me just mention a few things along the way leading up to that point in the chapter. 
So in the early on, Rothbard says, in the real world then, quality of judgment and accuracy of forecast play an enormous role in the income acquired by capitalists. And so he's, what he's saying there, again, he's contrasting that we've talked about in the last chapter that one way you earn income is um, for labor services and then also is an interest return just because of the passage of time, because of time preference. And then, you know, you can earn it as a, as a, as a labor, um, excuse me, as a landowner, but then if you think that that was capitalized, even that in a sense is, is an interest return. So that's why he makes the, the statement that you might have thought it was a mistake in the beginning of the chapter I'm talking about now where he says, the only two types of income in the ERA are interest in wages. And you might have thought, well, what about the land, uh, rents for, for landowners? But he's, he's including that in interest because if it gets capitalized, then it's really the rent for land is also interest. Um, but in the real world, there's another category of income, and that's entrepreneurial profit and loss. And that specifically is due to the ability of someone to rearrange the structure of production to better serve the consumer's um, desires than if that, pers- if that entrepreneur hadn't intervened. Or if you suffer a loss, it's because the opposite, that you, you made things even worse. That the original structure of production was a certain way and it was going to satisfy consumer ends, and then you came in and, and you tinkered with it and it wasn't a good tinkering. And so you, you hurt consumers and in a market economy, you get penalized for that by suffering a loss. Well, now what's interesting, the reason I like that quote is that he says the quality of judgment, the accuracy of your forecasts, and that's really how you're getting the, um, this type of income. And so you won't see that really in other schools of thought very much, that the, the Austrians are fairly unique in that they recognize that in the, in the market economy, there is a definite role to, for someone to play that, you know, you say to someone, well, what do you do? He said, oh, I'm a really good singer. Well, what do you do? Oh, I, um, I'm a good, a good pitcher. And there are certain people in the market economy, what do they do is they see the future better than other people do, and then they go and make money off of it. And that that's a very, you know, some people that sounds very crass, but no, that's, that's crucial, that that's what's, we're in a world of uncertainty, and so the people that anticipate the future better than others that's a very important thing, and we want to make sure, if they're depending on how much their advantage is, that they're aware of that fact. And so instead of them being a school teacher, if no, if they really can anticipate IBM's share price better than anyone else on the planet, maybe that's what they should be doing with their lives, is speculating on the stock market. Okay? So the market economy, now they don't have to do that, of course. They're free to be a school teacher, but the point is they need to know how, what am I missing out on? And again, in a market economy where people are allowed to keep the fruits of their efforts, that's what would happen. They would know if I went and speculated in the stock market, I think I could make a bunch of money. And actually, that's um, that's really almost the, the purest form of, of entrepreneurship in a sense is someone who speculates just in purely financial matters. Because there, like if you think oil prices are going to be higher or lower and you think the market's wrong on that, you don't even ever have to actually physically deal with oil, you can just go into the futures market and either buy or, or sell, depending on what you think the, the trend is going to be, and then you can get rid of the contract before it matures. And so you've, you've never dealt with anything except electronic uh, transactions, and yet you are influencing production. If you make profits, we, you know, we can argue and go through the steps later if you want as to how that is serving consumers. All right, so... Uh, again, this, the market economy is really amazing in the fact that the specialization is more of these financial derivatives become available. This ability of people just in terms of pure speculation, their ability to forecast the future better than most other people allows them to earn an income and they are certainly performing a service just as the guy who goes and, and tills the soil is performing a service and that's why he gets paid for it. And the, the other point there too is um, Rothbard says that there's profit... A profit opportunity means that some factors are underpriced. And so what Rothbard has in mind is entrepreneurs buying factors of production, waiting for the product to be uh, produced, and then selling it, and that the return they get exceeds the interest return. And so that's, that's the standard benchmark case. And that's why Rothbard's saying, oh, so a profit opportunity means factors are underpriced. But, of course, if you thought factors were overpriced and you had sophisticated enough markets where you could short sell things, then... You know, you could, you could profit from the other way too. That if you thought a stock was overpriced, you could short it, and then when the price came down, you know, you'd earn your profit that way. So, again, in the more general case with uh, modern markets, as long as factors are mispriced, an entrepreneur can profit by speculating one way or the other. So, this leads into another point that Rothbard stresses is that, okay, so first of all, mainstream economists, they almost never talk about 
economic profits, except maybe in an intro micro class when they're trying to get you to see the difference between accounting and economic profit. But then really that drops out, especially at graduate school. I I might not, never have heard the term entrepreneur at, at NYU except in the Austrian colloquium. I, it, that's, I think that's that's a true statement, that I, they never talk about profit once you get to the level where you're doing general equilibrium theory and everything's in equilibrium, what, what, what role would there be for entrepreneurship or profits and losses? But then Rothbard says, okay, but sometimes they do talk about profit, but what you'll never hear mainstream economists focus on is the role of loss, that they just talk about profits as if they're natural, and they talk about, well, what's the natural rate of profit? And so Rothbard is emphasizing that, well, no, that's silly. There's no such thing as a natural rate of profit, because if you think that way, well, then I'm going to ask you, what's the natural rate of loss? And that, that just sounds crazy. And so it's the same thing um, with profits, that if there is a profit in an industry, then people flock to it and it gets competed away, just like if there's a loss going on right now in a certain industry, people get out of it, and so, so the loss disappears. All right, so that's, and it's, uh, it's crucial to understand that that also performs a function, that it's not, that, oh yeah, profits are great, and then also, unfortunately we have to accept losses as well, that no, if, if losses are being suffered, it's showing that the structure of production is not designed to best satisfy the wants of the consumers, and so the losses are a necessary signal, if you will, to tell entrepreneurs you're messing up, you gotta uh, reform what you're doing. And another point that he mentions is that the profit and loss, so it's not only that if somebody rearranges the structure of production, takes factors from what other people were gonna use them for and devotes them somewhere else, and if that's, if the consumers in a, in a broad sense approve of what you did, you earn profits, but or and if, if you do it and the consumers don't like what you did, you suffer losses. So there's that fact, but on top of it, it's proportionate. So that if you really improve things, then you earn a lot of profit, or if you really screwed up, then you earn a, suffer a huge loss. And so that's what's, um, that point's good when you're trying to understand different government programs and they're trying to subsidize things or they're trying to penalize things. And it's really, for example, there's all this talk now about, oh, well, let's come into the... Um, the oil and commodities markets, and if speculators are behaving in a certain way, and if we think they're manipulating the price when they ought to be selling, if you know they're hoarding it, and they, and they ought to really be selling for a profit, that a book profit, then we'll come in and, and try to get them to do that. And and really, that, that thinking is wrong because the market economy gives the exact incentives that you would want. That you don't want people to be terrified of of suffering a loss, and so they never take any risks as entrepreneurs. And at the same time, though, you don't want them to be reckless. And so the, the market economy says, okay, to the extent that you improve things, you get, in a sense, paid accordingly. And, you know, it's okay if you just screw up a little bit and you mess up somebody's order at McDonald's and maybe you'll lose that person as a customer. But, you know, if you poison the whole town because you put poison in the, in the burger thinking that's a good way to save costs, then that's, you're going to suffer a lot of losses, okay? So the point is, again, that People don't talk about profit very much. They almost never talk about loss, and then they also don't ever really talk about the fact that it's not just those categories, but it's the quantitative amount that's necessary to get entrepreneurs to, to have the right incentives in terms of doing the things if your goal is how do we motivate the most able, talented people in our society to help the masses. You know, I mean, if you, want, if you were like a, a socialist or something, or not a socialist, but if you were just some humanitarian, you thought, what kind of system could we invent that gets the smartest people, the greediest people, the most ambitious people to devote their lives to improving the lot of the common man, if, if you just were locked in a room and thought through it, you would probably come up with the market economy, or, or you could come up with the market economy. That would be a good answer. Okay. Um, one little quibble here I have with Rothbard. He says at one point, every entrepreneur believes that the market has underpriced factors. I mean, I'm, um, there's dots in there that he's, I'm, I'm shortening it, but... His point is that Rothbard is saying, look, in order for somebody to enter the factory markets, buy factors, and then hope to transform them and sell a product and earn entrepreneurial profit, that particular entrepreneur must believe that the market has underpriced factors. And I'm, I'm not sure that might be, um, of course we understand what he's talking about, but I'm just wondering about the case where somebody who's just investing because they want to just maintain their, their money or they want to grow it at interest that you know, someone who puts their money in a mutual fund or whatever, they're certainly not picking those stocks because they think the market has underpriced those particular stocks. And then even if you're not thinking of the stock market just in general, if someone comes into inheritance and has a bunch of money, you know, back in the 1800s and says, well, what, what do I do with this? I don't want it just to sit here. I want it to earn interest. 
that you know maybe his heart buddy says, oh, why don't you you know get in the shoe business and and you know buy things. So it, my point is just that I'm not sure that if that's necessarily true. Um, obviously, if you thought there were underpriced factors, that would you would tend towards that line if you had money to invest. But it is possible, I think, that somebody could not expect to beat the market, as it were, but yet because of their time preferences, they don't want to consume everything in the present. They want to earn interest, and so th that's um, a possible uh, slight mistake or understatement by Rothbard there. Okay, and another um, good point that Rothbard makes is he says, Profit is a sign of a of a prior maladjustment, and so if you see firms that are earning lots of profits, people think that's a sign of a you know something's I don't know something's wrong with the world. And Rothbard says yes, in a sense that's true, but it's not the people earning the profits; they're the ones fixing it. So yes, if there are huge profit opportunities and you see some company earning a bunch of money uh, profit, that in a sense, it's correct for us to say, "Oh, wow, you know, things weren't weren't all all wasn't well with the situation." But again, it's why are we getting mad at the companies or the the individuals who are doing more than anyone else on the planet what they need to do to address the situation? And again, just the recent news with the oil companies. I mean, the reason oil is so expensive is because depreciating dollar, but also just the fact that demand has risen a lot more the last few years than most people anticipated, and and yeah, ironically, so so who are we mad at? So we don't have as much oil as we, we really ought to have for our desires, and so who are we mad at? Well, let's get mad at the companies that are out there spending billions of dollars finding more oil because, you know, we're really mad that we don't have much oil, and so we're going to go punish the people who are the ones doing something about getting more oil for us. So that's um, what Rothbard's point is there. All right, let me read this quote from Hayek that he talks about on 517. And this was, so this is the bottom of 517 if you've got it. So again, quoting Hayek, and Hayek says, The continuance of the existing degree of capitalistic organization depends, accordingly, on the prices paid and obtained for the product of each stage in, of production, and these prices are therefore a very real and important factor in determining the direction of production. All right, so that, that really struck me, and it, before looking over this last night when I was preparing my remarks, it had never really struck me why did Hayek entitle his book Prices in Production, but I mean there it just jumps out at you that his point is, look, these market prices aren't just arbitrary numbers on price tags, that market prices really do help coordinate things, and so entrepreneurs behave differently depending on what market prices are. So it's not, it's not that the entrepreneurs are robotic. I mean the prices don't determine action, but the prices certainly do influence what the entrepreneurs end up doing. And so that's what's, what I think most people don't realize if they don't have this view, this Austrian view of the structure of production, you know, with the, with the housing bust and all this, the, oh, the government needs to come in or whatever, there's a recession and the government needs to come in and, and keep prices at their prior levels. Well, no, I mean, how, how are people going to rearrange themselves and get into the correct lines of production, adjust to the new realities if prices aren't allowed to move to signal to entrepreneurs that this isn't working, this is what needs to happen now. Okay, so again, that's a, a very uh, subtle point. I just want to make sure you didn't miss that. And then on 518, he talks that Rothbard talks about the, the paradox of saving, and he refers to in, in footnote six there uh, an article by Hayek with the same title. And let me just encourage you I, again, this isn't for everybody, but if you are interested in capital theory and you want to see more, this is an excellent article by Hayek that even if you've read uh, Human Action and Man, Economy, and State, I think if you read this article by Hayek, you would come away understanding the structure of production better than, than before you read it. And what, what's going on in, the, in there, and, and maybe in the Q&A, maybe David Gord might be able to sh give us the, the full story, but it's something along the lines of these, these guys, um, they have a, like a contest, and they, they set out the paradox of savings, which was, you know, if all of a sudden consumers or individuals in the economy, they save more, so they spend less on consumption, how can it possibly be that um, businesses will expand? Because if, you, if, the, if the final chain in the link of production, if, the, if people are spending less down there, well, then those businesses are going to, you know, reduce their volume of activity. They're going to buy less from their suppliers and so on. So if consumers in general are spending less because they're saving more, how could it possibly be anything other than a general recession? And yet we know 
at the micro level that an individual household, what do you do if you want to consume more and more into the future? If you cut back now and, and invest those funds and earn interest, then your cons- disposable income can grow over time. And so that was the, and what some of these guys did is they, my understanding is they literally had a contest where they were going to pay people to say, you know, in our opinion, if you can answer this question or solve this riddle, we'll, um, I think they were going to give them some financial reward. And in their opinion, nobody answered the question right. And Hayek, in, in this article, agreed with those guys. And he said, he said, they're right. No one answered it, but now I'm going to. And I don't think Hayek got money for it. But the point is that um, he was saying this is a very tricky concept, and it's understandable that mainstream economists were sort of duped by the Keynesian revolution because they don't have this appreciation. Without, without understanding Austrian capital theory, it, it really would be difficult to get out of the paradox of saving. But once you understand Austrian capital theory, you can see, and, and Hayek points out there, and we'll talk about it in a minute, and Hayek just shows you know, graphically, this, this is the answer to their question. This is why you could have a lower volume of consumer spending, and yet that can support a, a, you know, more investment, and there's no one along the way that's losing money. It's all internally consistent. There's no paradox. Okay, so yeah, why don't we get into that now? All right, let me, I'll just do them one at a time. So, so this is obviously from the study guide. Okay, let me just make sure, this is probably going to be review for most of you, but let me make sure we all understand. There's a lot going on in these diagrams. Let me make sure you see all the little bells and whistles. Um, okay, so first of all, again, it's the, the 100 ounces at the bottom. That is the amount being spent by consumers on the consumer good and and also let me also whenever I go look at these things I haven't seen them in a while I always get tripped I'm always off by a level so if that's happening to you don't worry it happens to me too Um, so let's look up here so what's happening is this entrepreneur and I know this is review but I want to make sure we see this one so that we understand the next one Um, this high level I guess it would be the sixth stage gives 19 ounces to the land and labor factors, because at this point there's no capital good, there's nothing, it's just all land and labor, gives 19 ounces, and they work on something, and then a year later sells a capital good, a good in progress, for 20 ounces to somebody else. So that's, ideally, if if we had a bunch of money, I I would pay a computer programmer to, to take this thing and turn it into like a neat little presentation on the computer where you could see the capital good ripening as it went down. Because with these numbers, it's kind of hard to picture that we, you know, we're just saying, oh, a passage of time, so that's why that has to earn an interest return. But no, the reason this person here is paying 20 is because that thing is something useful. It's a capital good that he's, yeah, I'll pay 20 ounces of gold for that. All right, so it's not that, that he cares about the time preference of the capitalist from the prior stage. No, he's paying 20 ounces of gold for this, this thing. He's, this guy who's paying 20 for, for this, it's not that um, he even needs to know what land and labor went into it. Okay, he, he could know that, but he doesn't need to know that. All right, so again, I, it, this is a little bit abstract, and it would be helpful when you're thinking through this to actually picture that as the good is moving down, I mean, it is physically being transformed step by step, so it's not just the mere passage of time. These land and labor factors are doing stuff to this thing to turn it into the eventual consumer good that's worth 100 ounces of gold. Okay, so... Um, so the 19 ounces there go to these land and labor factors, and again, so that, you know, some worker, somebody says, hey, what do you do for a living? He says, oh, I, I take raw uh, material from the land and I transform it into whatever the capital good is, and then the guy goes and sells it for 20 ounces of gold. And so that's what they do, and, and those people get, and, the, and some land, landowners also, they're selling the materials, the, the virgin materials that are being used to create this capital good from scratch. And again, that's what they, they get their income. So that's 19 ounces every period going to those two groups of people. And then the period later when this entrepreneur sells it for 20, that's where that one is coming from, right? It's, it's, he put out 19 a year later, was then able to sell it for 20, and so the interest return on the invested 19 was one ounce. Okay, and then again, the interest right there, it's you're earning a return of one for an investment of 19, it's... Um, a little bit more than 5%, but it's because of rounding, that Rothbard is um, trying to get around 5% for these things. 
Okay, and then I'll just, I'll just do a couple more. The next stage, what happens? So the guy at this stage pays 20 for the good in progress, the capital good from somebody else. Then he hires eight ounces of, again, raw inputs and other workers to work on this thing that he just paid 20 for. And then also it's for the, the additional virgin materials to be mixed with this thing that's a good in progress. And so he spends a total of 28. He invests a total of 28. That process takes a, a time period, whether it's a year or whatever the period is, and then he sells it for 30. All right. And so then his net return is two on the investment of 28. All right. And so that's how it unfolds. So a couple other, um, so you see here these vertical lines. This 83 is 19 plus 8 plus 13 plus 12 plus 16 plus 15. Okay. So that's, that's what's going on there. And this 17 is the sum of all these ones going off the side. And the 17 plus 83 is 100. So that's not coincidental. That, that's all, you know, makes sense. It needs to be like that. Um, the other thing I want, that's with this note, I want to make sure I didn't forget to tell you is, we're tending to think of these in the evenly rotating economy once it all settles down and the system keeps repeating itself so that, um, you know, every period the stuff all shifts forward one. And then these guys who are getting 19 take the virgin material and the raw labor and create a new one to enter the pipeline up here. And then every period the consumers are unloading the finished good from the bottom and consuming it. And so every period the stuff shifts down one. But before that can happen, if you first started this from scratch, this process, you would have to wait six years or six time periods for it to happen. That originally, you know, you would have to spend the 19, get this thing, and then uh, buy eight units more of land and labor and then sell it for 30 the next period. And so it would take six periods just for the first amount of the uh, consumer good to come off the, the line for consumers to get, all right? Um, w another... Uh, tangential point if you want to if you're interested in seeing the that intermediate adjustment process that what happens when you go from one stationary state then there's more net saving and investment and you end up in a new stationary state but we're just looking at snapshots after the adjustment has happened what if I wanted to look at the intermediate process like what, what does the consumer do for those six periods okay we we, um, we only spend 80 now we're investing 20, and what happens down here? Sure, at this. What happens down here is after everything is settled down again. But what happens in the intermediate six or seven periods when you're waiting for the results of that higher investment? If you want to see an analysis like that, actually, um, so first of all, high pure theory of capital. But a very short statement of it is actually in Paul Samuelson's article of summing up. So I, I mentioned the last talk, that believe it or not, Paul Samuelson really understands this. He, he thinks it's wrong, but he came up with these really clever mathematical example, you know, with, with numbers that were very convenient and nice round numbers to show, to, to illustrate what would happen during the adjustment process. So again, it's, it's a very clever little result. I disagree with Samuelson's conclusions, of course, but um, if, you're, if you like this sort of thing, like I said, Samuelson actually came up with a pretty good one to show the intermediate step. So this here, I'm just showing you a possible steady state, if you want to talk of it like that, after we've adjusted to the new amount of um, uh, gross investment. Okay, so here, what's going on? Let me stress, this is not, this is just one possibility. So this is consistent with the numbers Rothbard talks about in the book, but there, there's no reason that you say, oh, if, if consumers all of a sudden who used to spend 100 now spend 80, this is what the new structure of production is going to look like. That No, you, you can't say that you don't know. But this is just an example of what it could look like. All right, And in particular, you'll see that 1.6 is kind of funny. And you may say, well, why, you know, why did I pick that number? Well, it was just because um, there's a lot of different things that had to be true, that these numbers all had to be a certain way to work out. Like I knew this had to be 80. I knew um, gross investment had to be, what was it, 418 ounces and things like that. You knew that uh, this number plus this number had to add up to 80. So there's a lot of things that had to be true. And there also I wanted there to be seven steps, st seven stages. And I wanted the interest rate, the spread between each stage, to be less than 5% because we had to show a lower interest. So there's a lot of things. And so I wrote out this, you know, the things that had to be true 
and I could solve it. And so my brother's getting a PhD in math, so I asked him, how the heck do you solve this thing? And he, he showed me how you did it, and, you know, these were the, the best numbers I could come up with. And like I said, I just said, well, I wish I didn't have that weird 1.6 in there because it's so much lower than the other ones, but that was the best I could do. So, again, the point is there's nothing magical about these numbers. This is just to try to show you um, what, what, what it might look like with, with specific numbers in there. So, again, just very quickly, uh, what's going on here, uh, you'll see that there's an extra, extra layer now, that there's now a longer structure of production. And so this, you'll see, this solves the paradox of savings that, well, you know, how could it be if all of a sudden they restrict consumption to 80 ounces, you know, wouldn't all these people be going out of business? And, well, no. I mean, look at this diagram and, and tell me who's losing money here. What's, what, you know, there's no problem. And, and as Hayek points out in that article, the paradox of saving, it's because if you're not picturing producers earning returns in this fashion, then yeah, it, it really doesn't make sense if, if the people at the end of the chain are spending less, isn't that just going to have ramifications throughout the economy? And so everyone's got to earn less over time. And um, the, no, there's, there's no reason for that to be the case. Now, it's true, as Rothbard points out, the, the mon monetary returns are lower in the sense of the, the nominal returns. But again, production is going to actually be higher now because goods are, are invested in a longer, or as Bambavrik said, a more roundabout production process. Um, one last point about why these tables are kind of neat is if you want to say, well, what's the interest return to the capitalists? One way to do it, so this 10.1, one way to figure that out is to just sum up these numbers. But another way to do it is to, to multiply the gross investment by the interest rate. And so you would know the interest rate by saying, okay, um, you know, this guy spent 17 and then he turned around and sold it for 17.5, so it's 0.5 divided by 17, it's roughly, I think it's 3%, right? Is that what I said? Yeah. Okay, so you could deduce the, so if I just handed you this chart, you could figure out what the interest rate was in this economy, and then, like I say, it also works out, it's not a coincidence that if you multiply the interest rate by the gross investment, that is the sum of these numbers, okay? So these, these are pretty neat little diagrams, there's a lot packed into them, and they all fit together, and um, again, just a, a contribution of, of Rothbard to, to boil down something very difficult into a, a neat little diagram like this. Okay, let me uh, take that off so you're not mesmerized by it. Um, let me, let's see what time we got. Okay, I'll just go about five more minutes and then I'll open it up for Q&A. Let me say a word about Bumbavirk. Um I think you're going to find that if you go and read Bumbavirk in the original, He's, um, I, I think Mises dismisses him too easily or too quickly in human action. All right, for those of you who have read the critique there, it's the, I'm not saying that Bambavrik's theory is, is a good one and that we ought to embrace it, but I'm just saying the Mises seems to think he gave him a knockout blow in, in two sentences, and it, it really wasn't. Like, I think Bambavrik would just say, yeah, that's exactly what I just said. What are you talking about? So, um, in any event, uh, let me just mention that. Now, in terms of roundaboutness, because Rothbard talks about this and he's arguing that it's, it's really an unfortunate uh, choice of terminology. Let me just explain again why did, did Bambavrik pick that word. I mean, he obviously didn't pick the English word, but you know what I mean. Because um, he was thinking, look, there's different ways you can, you can uh, produce something. So if I want to, let's say I have a cottage somewhere and there's a stream that's a, that's a football field length away, the, 100 yards away, and I want to get the water from the stream to my cottage, well, there's different ways I can do it. And I, what do I have to work with? Well, I have my labor, and then I'm in a forest. There's all sorts of natural raw materials there. And the issue is, well, how do I get water into my cottage? That's the consumption good that I'm, I'm aiming for. And so a very direct method, it would be I go down to the stream, and I just cut my hands and pick the water up like that. So that that's not roundabout. That's very direct. But, of course, the um, volume of water per unit of my labor input is very low. And so then Bambarik wants to say, but instead of doing that, why don't I adopt a more roundabout approach? Instead of directly going for what I want, what if I use my labor and I go and I find a coconut and then I you know, cut it open and I hollow it out, so now I have this thing that's like a bowl, and then I go down and, and scoop up the water that way. Surely I'm going to, you can see that the, the physical quantity of water per unit of my labor input is going to be much higher that way. 
Okay, so the reason he's calling it roundabout is that if someone saw me grabbing a coconut and said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, because I'm really thirsty. Well, they might think I was going to drink the coconut milk, but okay, you know what I mean. All right, so anyway, that's, that's why he calls it roundabout. And then, of course, you know, if you really wanted to get a lot of water per unit of your labor input, you would go and, and first create a shovel and you would dig a trench from your cabin to the stream and then, you know, you would do all sorts of things that I have no idea. I, I would die if I were put in the woods right now. So I don't know exactly what you would do, but I'm, I know somebody who is more uh, resourceful than I am would figure out a way to get water from the stream into their cottage. And they would. And, and so the point is, what, what is this um, the superior productivity of roundabout production processes? Specifically what it is, it's, it's a purely physical concept, and he's saying, if you wanted to look at how many gallons or how many liters of water per unit of my labor input do I get, clearly you could you see that, oh, I get more if, if I do the more roundabout processes, but of course they're further in the future, that it takes me time to go and hollow out the coconut or it takes me time to build the shovel, to, build, to dig the trench. All right, so if, if I really need water, you know, if somebody's dying of thirst in my cabin, I'm not going to go find a coconut. I'm going to run to the stream and, and run back and forth ten times. But the point is that if I want to, you know, increase my standard of living over time, I'm going to adopt these other processes. So that, it's that insight. That's why Bambavrik thinks saving and investing in capital goods enhances the, the productivity of our labor. All right, so that, that's where he's coming from. That that's, that's the way he views it. And that's why Austrians think that Capital goods, in a sense, really are just um, embodiments of inputs of labor and land and then it, the time savings, that that's all they really are. So they view capital goods more as just a, cre a creature of the original land and labor. Um, okay, one last thing, and then I gotta, I'll stop, is this issue of Rothbard makes a big point about if there's um, – let me, let me find it specifically – so I mentioned it. This is the last point in the study guide chapter. Okay, yeah. So he says that in any equilibrium situation, net saving is zero by definition since net saving means a change in the level of gross saving over the previous period of time. All right, and he uses that a lot, and it's also tied into his argument about why um, net saving and investment go hand in hand with a progressing economy and vice versa. This, if you're in a graduate economics program, this is, this is gonna trip you up and you're not gonna understand it because, um, in a mainstream program, when they talk about net saving and gross investment and things like that, what they, what they have in mind is, alright, you have a, a capital stock and then every period some of it's gonna depreciate and so you need to invest at least the amount to offset the depreciation just to maintain the capital stock from period to period. And then if you invest more than that, that's net investment and that's going to expand the capital stock. And so that's the way the mainstream is thinking about it and that doesn't dovetail with what, what Rothbard's talking about it. And for example, you could, in a mainstream uh, solo growth model or something, you can certainly have net investment over time and it's an equilibrium situation. Everybody sees it coming and there's no profits being earned and it's the, the capital stock expands over time. And uh, I... I think the, the, if you want to say, well, what's, why are they coming to such different conclusions? I mean, they're, given their definitions, they're, they're both valid, but I think the reason Rothbard thinks of it this way and, and a, the, you know, Solo thought of it the different way is mainstream economists tend to think of capital as, uh, fixed capital. They, they're picturing a machine that, you know, sits in, in the factory and, and is useful for 10 years and then it, it wears out and then you have to buy a new machine. And so if you've got 100 machines, you know, every year you've got to buy 10 more or else your machines are going to dwindle over time. That's the way a mainstream economist is thinking of it, whereas Austrians tend to think of, when they're thinking about gross investment and capital, they're thinking of the goods and process moving down the pipeline. And so there, every period, you need to go buy more flour if you're a baker. It's not that... All right, so I got, yeah, that's maybe a good way to think of it. The, the mainstream economist is picturing the oven in the bakery and that you have to put aside money for the depreciation fund, whereas the Austrian tends to think of the, the raw material inputs and how you have to replenish them every period. And if, if some period you just decide, you know what, I got this money from selling bread, I'm not going to buy any flour, then the process comes to a standstill. All right, so I think that's partly why they adopt 
different definitions of what what does net saving mean. 